Yes, yeah, so this is just going to be, I've got to get this out, and I've just returned from shopping, as one has to do, and this is the time to release it. There is a song, I've been recording it, just not professional recording as such, but I want you to hear it. It will prepare your heart, but it won't be released till after this, which is good. I want it in that order so you can listen to that and then come into this message. But for those who are early, you'll hear it as it is. Followers of Christ. There's a lot in that. Colossians 3 verse 4 and 1 John 3 verse 2. Two different apostles saying the same thing. Listen to this. When Christ, who is our life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Wow, that's an event. John adds, when he is revealed, we shall see him as he is, for we shall be like him. Now, that's an awesome uh account truth revelation of what the day of the lord will be like for followers of christ we we shall be like him translated in an instant but at his revelation as uh, and i believe the word is the uh, revelation it, it's unveiling christ will appear the day of the Lord is coming. Jesus is coming. And when Christ, who is our life, appears, herein is one of those great declarations of what it is to be a follower of Christ. Christ, who is our life. That's the difference I want to bring out today as followers of Christ. If we stay consistent, to the Bible's version of Christianity, we shall find that we are to lose our life for the sake of great gaining the life of Christ. Remember, he is our life now. Jesus said it in Matthew 16, 24 and 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, if anyone desires to come after me, let him take up his cross, deny himself and follow me taking up a cross, denying ourselves and follow him. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Now that's a message you don't often hear. Voiced. We lose our lives, and if we seek to cling to them, we're losing something. God will keep trying to win us and train us and change our thinking. And bring, And I'm amazed at how much deception I've walked in, self-deception really, over the years. As you get older, it's just becoming clearer and clearer in the light of the presence of God how much we tolerate of things we shouldn't tolerate and slowly but surely we are being weaned from them we'll talk about that truly there is a joy beyond all measure in being a follower of christ but if we lose sight of the real thing remember coca-cola the real thing if we lose sight of the real thing of being followers we shall be in all kinds of trouble we shall forever be looking to find some joy to take the place of the true joy of being a follower of Christ. The joy of being a follower of Christ is that his life is within us. It, let's go on because you're still probably shocked. I've got to lose my life. Not necessarily, you know, not necessarily physically in martyrdom but to let it go, stop clinging to it, to discover something. It's not just down, down negative. It's totally the opposite. It's so that we discover the real life we were created for. We'll, we'll talk about that. In some great miraculous and mysterious way, it is in losing our life that we gain Christ's life and we find our own true life. 
It seems strange that in losing our life, we actually discover the only true life we were created for. See, this is the gain. This is what we gain. We discover who we really are. And that's a challenge, isn't it? For those outside of Christ, there is this endless and frantic pursuit to find their own life, which equates to finding pleasures and rewards to fill the emptiness. Hebrews 2 verse 15 has a very uh, uh, poignant thing to say to those outside of Christ. It says, uh, forever driven because of their fear of death, they are in bondage. So that fear of death, even though they don't consciously admit it, it's driving them on in a similar way to discover um, pleasures and rewards and to keep cling desperately to that life through fear of death. When the fear of death is gone because I'm in Christ, he's going to appear. I'm going to be like him. I'm going to see him. I'm going into eternity. He's gone to prepare a place for me forever. So I've lost that fear of death. I don't want to die or be shot particularly, but it's not a Oh, I'll lose everything. No, I'll gain everything to be translated into the presence of Christ. I'm still enjoying life down here. And uh, I believe I have something to do down here in speaking God's word. And, and it's becoming, that's the only thing left to do. And oh boy, oh boy, there's a song. And um, that's a big song. I'll, I'll play that, uh, record it a bit better soon. Now, I will say across this planet, there are many thousands of people who have been brought to a simpler message of Christ, if you like. And in many ways, I don't want to blow that out of the war because it's usually what I present is just an invitation to all, to anyone, to hear something of this Jesus who was crucified, buried, raised again from the dead. This Jesus who died to take away, away our sin so that we might be brought into a saving relationship with God the Father through Christ. This is the simple invitation, a relationship with God Almighty the Father through Christ. That's the only way to have a relationship with Almighty God. We've said it before. Jesus, the only way, the only truth, the only life, the only way to the Father, to have a relationship with Him. You can play religion, false religions, any religions, but to have a relationship with the Father, you have to be a new creation in Christ. Said it before. So I better press on. I know time is going already. Yes, you see that that invitation to be brought into a saving knowledge and relationship with Christ, with God the Father through Christ. Yes, that's the invitation. We don't live there forever, do we? Because sooner or later, Jesus, God, will start drawing us deeper into that relationship. What we will read at times in the Bible will challenge the very core of who we are. And it's the very core of who we are that is brought to the cross by taking up our cross. And we start losing and letting go of things we've held on to. Uh, where do I put it? Uh, where did I put it? Somewhere. Oh, I've got, I've got it. Maybe we'll get to it. I'll say this now. <clears throat> there are two things I hope I have avoided in speaking God's word. And that is that I hope to have avoided being as the soothsayers. That's one. And the next thing is to be a Pharisee, a legalistic Pharisee. I hope I, you realize, even though my stuff sometimes is strong, it is not the Pharisee or legalism. It's coming straight out of the New Testament, out of the mouth of the apostles and the Lord. And they have some very strong things. This is why I'm bringing this. But it's not legalism or Pharisaic uh, thing. And it's not the suicides. 
these things provoke God very much. They, uh, they would, the suicide would say whatever people wanted to hear, a bit like many politicians, you might agree, and they would say whatever itching ears wanted to believe. I, I hope I've avoided being a suicide, and, uh, and I'll just talk about suicides. It's interesting that Daniel was shown by God an interpretation to ki a king's dream that none of the soothsayers could give. Even the king saw through their guessing games as they played for time because the king sentenced them to death if they couldn't give the interpretation. And they couldn't, so they were starting to be executed. And this is the words because Daniel not only gives the interpretation because God gives him the same dream that he'd given to the, this king, which is pretty a, a strange and amazing ability of God to replay a dream. I've said that before in a message. It's incredible. He, Daniel ends up saving the lives of all these soothsayers and his own life, of course. Listen to the word. Daniel answered in the presence of the king and said, the secret which the king has demanded, the wise men, the astrologers, the magicians, and the soothsayers cannot declare to the king. It is interesting, in the culture of that day, it was normal to have these advisors in the king's palace. It is still with us today and given various disguises. Astrologers, magicians, soothsayers are everywhere. I hope not too many in the church. Isaiah says in 2, 6, chapter 2, verse 6, for you have forsaken your people, the house of Jacob, Israel, because they are filled with eastern ways. They are soothsayers like the pagan nations around them. God forsook them and drew away from them. He hasn't forsaken them totally because we know the Bible. God faithfully works and works to draw people to a repentant place so that he can bless them. But at this statement from Isaiah, God has forsaken you because you are filled with the ways of the East, soothsayers. Now, a bit about the Pharisee. One very favored father in the faith I once knew, wonderful man of God, now in heaven, pointed out that there is within us all a Pharisee waiting to get out, to come out. A Pharisee will point out all the things you ought to be, all the things you ought to do, but provide no means and no power to do them. A legalistic heart with no mercy. I hope I, you, I, if you knew me, I've wept with people in explaining and talking and sharing. I hope I have avoided those two things. I want to say that anyway. I hope that will help you to do the same. Avoid those things. So to those who have been invited into a saving relationship with Christ, I hope you are hungry to go deep, deeper in that relationship. And as you open that Bible, there will be many things that challenge you to the core. I said it earlier, but... It is the core of who you are that will be brought to an ever-increasing identification with Christ through the cross. It's, it's the bio, biblical Christianity that you do well to receive it. Even that plain verse from Jesus, he who seeks to keep his life will lose it, but he who loses his life, not talking about physical, in, 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 although that sometimes the, the place for some of the martyrs. But to lose your life is to be yielding. It's a bit like this song. Oh, that's an awesome song. Not because I sung it. Not particularly good singing. But it, it's the statements that are made. And you'll, you'll hear that one day. You 
will begin to appreciate the freedom that your heart longs for is only found in following Christ more deeply in full surrender. You will find that your heart, as you begin to be shaped by God's word, your heart will be, become hungry to know the Lord more deeply and your heart longing, you will understand and appreciate that that's why God has this work, the working of the cross in our lives, because you know you want to be closer to him. I'll quote John Wesley now. He said, you are as close to God as you want to be. Now that's a leveling challenge. You are as close to God as you want to be. There are things to do to go deeper. And it's not really works, is it? It's surrender. It's taking up that cross. We do not live forever in that place of invitation. We go on from there, deeper in our relationship with God. A helpful saying from the pulpit is that you've been brought out of Egypt now to get Egypt out of you. And that's what I said earlier about some of the things I carried on thinking and unfortunately yielding to. And that was the world, the spirit, the thinking of this world still clinging. And God is always working to bring us closer, more like Jesus, and we really are enjoying it, although it's painful at times. But it's like the true identity of who we are. You more and more discover. And one day we will be translated, be in heaven and we'll think, wow, I'm so glad I got rid of more of that stuff, the other side of eternity, you know, in this present life, than I had at the beginning the baggage thank god trying to rush through to the end now followers of christ as we are as well as speaking into this reality of christ who is a life i would remind us of the true call as his ambassadors and it's the same thing but going now from his work within us to his spirit and work upon us through us ambassadors now we begin to identify that the spirit of god is upon us the spirit of the lord is upon me to do something to speak his word to pray because some people don't necessarily be in a pulpit won't necessarily even be on the streets preaching they'll be able to share with friends neighbors that christ is our hope but they might not ever be seen or noticed, but there is a working of the Spirit of God upon you in prayer, in worship. And this is the point I'm getting to. Um, the apostle gives us a very helpful phrase in 2 Corinthians 13, 3, which I have used before. Since you seek proof of Christ speaking in me, that, you see, that is an understanding that is with those who are called and anointed to minister life. Christ is speaking in us, through us. And that was the great enjoyment of living at times in what you could call revival. Where the glory of God was real and the power of God was real. And the, the giftings were real. Christ speaking in me. There are endless other examples from the Bible, other than the one I quoted from the Apostle, which show us that the true ministry we are called into is Christ in us being revealed. I love the one where God says, we are the fragrance of Christ to those who are perishing and to those who are being saved. The, the very fragrance of Christ is, is oozing out of us and convicting some of the, the fact that they are not with Christ, they don't like that, and some do like it and they yield to it and come and ask more. They want to be followers of Christ. They're hungry. 
God speaking through us by the Holy Spirit. One of the simplest and yet forsaken realities of the church gathered is that Christ is in our midst and he wishes to spill out his glory among and through us. Did you hear that? When the church is gathered, Christ in our midst wishes to spill out his glory among us and through us. Christ in our midst wants to spill out, splash around the glory, you know, throw it on us, breathe through us, speak through us when the church is gathered. So it was a longer message. We'll take it up again. Christ in our gatherings. And 1 Corinthians 14, 26 says this, How is it then, brethren, when you come together as the church, each of you has a psalm, has a teaching, has a tongue, has a revelation, has an interpretation of a tongue? Let all things be done for the building up of the body of Christ. And as I said most recently, seek that you may prophesy. The apostle said, seek it, desire it, so that you might build the church. Now, having a psalm is not reading a psalm. Having a psalm is having a prophetic song of the Spirit and singing it, even if you haven't got a good voice. Having a teaching is not, well, I read this in William Barclay's commentary. No. I have a teaching because God drew me through the waters and the fire this week. And I've got something to say that will help you go through fire and through waters. <laughs> yeah, a tongue, speak in tongues, interpret that tongue. Somebody else interprets that tongue. Have a revelation. I'm seeing something. Does this mean anything to anyone? I have a revelation, or oh, I had a vision last week. I haven't recorded that. That was dramatic. That was end time stuff. You better get ready for the end time because the day is coming. And uh, if what God wants me to share that one day, I believe he wants you to hear that song one day. So we'll come to that one day. There are great treasures and riches to be known as Christ's life is real in us. A calling to, this is another side to that, there's that gathering and the ministry of the Holy Spirit, one spirit flowing out, spilling out his glory, yes. But there's another really awesome thing that God has because Christ is in us. A calling to minister to God Almighty personally. No people, not for the streets, not for the pulpit, to minister to Almighty God personally. You and Him. <laughs> Where do you get that? In the Bible. One of the most profound callings I've seen in the Bible to actually minister to Almighty God personally there are you know there are, uh, verses and thoughts in the bible that talk about us being refreshing to the presence of god as well as what i'll talk about in a minute but we can refresh the heart of god just by being his and and a worshiper we can bless the lord it's like when jesus said when the son of man comes will he really find faith in the earth. He'll find plenty of workers, but will he find that connected lover of God longing to see him? In Jeremiah 33, 21 and other places in Jeremiah, we see that it defy it talks of this. God is speaking and he says, those who minister to me, Levites, priests, who minister to me, my ministers, God calls them. We're all called into this calling now because Christ is in us as a kingdom of priests, kings and priests because of the anointing, not on your own, forget that, because Christ is in us, the anointing is on us. We can minister to God, bless the Lord, 
and I don't know. We do it, I do it, and I don't know what I'm ministering to God or all the time or understand it, but it's a focus, it's, it's, an, it's an offering, it's, it's a devotion, it's a longing, it's a heart, it's a relationship. A relationship gone higher, deeper. Now, I'll just give some definition here just to help you. The same eternal Christ, eternal Christ. Christ is the eternal Son of God. He was with the Father in the beginning. And God the Father has no beginning and no end. And Christ was there when God the Father had no beginning and no end. He is the eternal Son of God. But it says in 1 Corinthians 10.4, as the children of Israel were led in the Old Testament through the desert, interesting that it took them 40 years to go in an 11 day journey. It was 11 days away, but for reasons I'll leave you to study, they wandered in the wilderness for 40 years as God dealt with them. But it says they all drank of that same spiritual rock for they drank of that spiritual rock that followed them led them really and that rock was Christ and I'll show you what it looked like the eternal Christ was leading them in the Old Testament Exodus 13 21 and the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and to <laughs> to lead the way and by night in a pillar of fire to give them light so as to be led by day and night. Christ led them as a pillar of fire and a cloud of glory. Christ, the eternal Christ, was there. The rock they drank of and led them by a pillar of fire and a cloud of glory. That same Christ is who we are following. This is the point. Do you get it? Now, even Jesus himself walked in this constant dependence upon hearing and seeing the Father. That's amazing. Because the eternal Christ became a man and took on flesh. I won't in long make this video any longer with another beautiful verse. Jesus took on the form of man. And being found in appearance as man, he humbled himself in obedience even to death, the death of the cross. But it was the eternal Christ who became a man. And that man, Jesus, depended upon hearing and seeing the Father daily, min minute by minute, continuously being led by the Spirit of God. Jesus answered and said, most assuredly, this is John 5, 19, I say to you, the Son can do nothing of himself, but what he sees the Father do, for whatever the Father does, the Son also does in like manner. And again, John 5, 30, I can of myself do nothing, as I hear, I judge, and my judgment is righteous, because I do not seek my own will, but the will of the Father who sent me. I'm hearing, and I'm seeing the Father. And I'm ministering out of that. <laughs> that's what Jesus said, and that's what I live to do. Not very good at it necessarily, but that's what we are as followers of Christ meant to do. Today, the Bible says, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are sons of God. And I don't know whether I've written it here, but the Bible says of the Father that he is bringing many sons to glory. You could find that verse if you put sons to glory, bringing many sons to glory. You see, God is not just after workers. He's bringing many sons to glory. And those who are led 
by the Spirit of God, Romans 8, 14. These are sons of God. Some preachers make a big point of that. It's the word huios, mature sons. There is a call to be mature and be led by the Holy Spirit, just like Jesus, very costly. Just as the people of God were led in the Old Testament by the rock, Christ Jesus, so we are led today by the same Holy Spirit, by the same Christ we are led. Remember the Lord, Exodus thirteen twenty one. the Lord went before them by day in a pillar of cloud and at night by a pillar of fire so as to give them light, so as to lead them by day and night. We are followers of Christ and he goes before us and speaks in us. We learn to hear what the Father is doing and do only those things. We are followers and following Christ. I pray that you will taste of what it is to be under the power of God. If only the church gathered as we read that verse and that was the environment. Someone has a psalm, has a revelation that Christ in our midst is spilling out, splashing his glory over us and that you would be able to discover who you really are by the power of God at resting on you as you tremble. I've been in places in my early life more than in these last few years where the power of God was upon me and I was shaken as the spirit of prophecy was on me. What a wonderful experience and what a fruitful experience. May God bless you as you follow, follow Christ, follow Christ, invite him in closer where you are. Get used to his presence, get used to his presence, invite him. This song, eventually when I do it, will help you to enter that place where Christ is in the room and you're saying to him, where are we being led today? See how costly it can be. Uh, but he's gracious and to treat you, especially if you can find a group who are gathered in that place of power and glory. Amen.